medicine, you then subspecialized to double down on one particular organ, a beautiful organ called the kidney, which give us, you know, a little bit of a, a sense of like, what is it about the kidney that is so special? Because it is a pretty special organ. You know, in internal medicine, everybody sort of divides themselves into types, right? So in medical school, it's interesting because you have the jocks who go into orthopedics, right? And then you have the really sort of touchy-feely people and they go into family medicine and pediatrics. And internal medicine generally attracts a lot of people who sort of like to think about things. And then within internal medicine, you have the sort of subdivision into the different types. And generally, when at least when where I was going to school at the University of Toronto, the nephrologists were always the ones who like to think about things because that's all we could do. We can do we couldn't do a lot about it, like you know, you stick people on dialysis and so on. But they like to think about problems like puzzles, like electrolyte problems and stuff. So you have this low sodiums and low potassiums and what's happening in the kidneys because the kidneys do a lot in terms of homeostasis. They keep track of, you know, they keep the sodium in check and you keep the proper amount of water and salt and potassium and calcium in the body. So it's, it's fairly complex, but it's a specialty where people like to think as opposed to like GI, which was towards these sort of action-oriented people who like to scope and you know, snare things out and stuff. So that was really what attracted me to nephrology, really, was that that's sort of my my personality, is I like to think about stuff. I, I like to work out puzzles. I'm addicted to Sudoku. It's just something I love to do, and it's just the way I am. So that's sort of why I chose nephrology, and I wound up doing it that at UCLA. I do enjoy it, and when I say there's not a lot we can do, what I mean is that up to a certain point, kidney disease, you can treat them, but there's really like two treatments, right? There's prednisone and then dialysis. <laughs> and the last time we had a drug that actually slowed down progression of kidney disease was like the ACE inhibitors in the 80s, right? It's been a long time since things changed. And just now we have the SGLT2s for diabetic kidney disease. Before that, it's like nothing. So there wasn't a lot to do, but it, there's a lot to think about. So that's sort of what I liked about it. And the kidney, I mean, every organ is unique in its own way. But one of the things that I recall being sort of blown away by in medical school was how smart the kidney was. You don't think of it as a particularly intelligent organ. You think of it as, well, it's just a filter. But there was a very clever design in evolution which said, rather than the kidney learning what is bad and figuring out a way to always get rid of things that are bad, it was, it was the opposite. It was learn what is good. And when you throw everything out during the first pass of filtration, just learn to pull back the good because the probability that the good things are going to change is low. The probability that you'll see new bad things is high. And so I remember the nephrologist sort of standing there saying, look, it would be tempting to think that the kidney would operate like it's going into your sock drawer to pull out just the right sock, but it doesn't. It pulls out all of the socks and puts back the right ones. And that always sort of stuck with me, one, as a pretty interesting statement of just how important it is to have that system working. And the second thing is how small the organ is, and yet what a high fraction of our circulating blood volume passes through it. And as you build on that, which gets to some of the stuff we're going to talk about today, why the kidney is such an early warning indicator of disease, either through high blood pressure or high glucose. I mean, is it safe to say that some would argue that the eyes are generally the first place you can see evidence of that disease, of either high blood pressure, or high glucose, but the kidneys would probably come in pretty close as well, wouldn't they? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So the thing about the kidney is that they get like 20% of the entire circulation of the body. So it's a huge amount of blood that goes through. And then the amount that comes out through the glomerulus, which is the sort of functional unit of the kidney, is huge. So basically, they take everything out and then sort of put it back in. So that's why they can fine tune it so well. But there's a huge amount of fluid that goes through the kidney sort of all the time. Even though a trickle comes out as urine, like it's filtering like... 10 times more than that. So you might have a liter of urine a day, but you're filtering way more than that every single minute, truthfully. So it's an incredible system. And the reason that the eyes and the kidneys are such early warning indicators is that the eyes is the best because you can actually directly visualize. It's the only place you can directly visualize the blood vessel 
But the glomerulus, which is, you know, you have about a million of these glomeruli in the, in the body, but they're basically a big bag of blood vessels. So if you're going to have diseases of the blood vessel, which turns out to be where these metabolic diseases impact each other. So the heart disease and kidney disease, that comes later on. But there's so many blood vessels in the kidney that it gives you this sort of early warning. So the first thing you generally see in terms of diabetes or high blood pressure, you start to see this protein that appears in the urine. So you can measure it, something called the albumin to creatinine ratio, and you can actually see it. So when you start to get increased urinary albumin excretion, what you know is that there is damage to the vascular system just because the vascular tree is like so, so big there and you can directly measure it. So if you were to go to your liver, for example, there's nothing you can measure, right? So it's got a big vascular. So the lungs have a big vascular system, but you can't measure anything. Whereas the urine, you can actually directly measure it and the eyes, you can directly see it. So that's why they come out so early. So increased urine album excretion actually a very, very strong correlation to heart disease, not because having a bit of urine is so bad, but it tells you that there's something bad going on in the blood vessels of the kidney, which tells you that something bad is going on in the blood vessels of the body. So that's why looking directly into the eyes is useful and measuring the urine is very useful. Yeah. And because my skills for looking into patients' eyes are not good enough that I can reliably do that, I have in the past three years really started to pay much closer attention to cystatin C, creatinine, along with microalbumin for exactly this reason, because it sort of occurred to me in a momentary insight that if my interest is in longevity, which means trying to figure out a way to get people to outlive what their expected time course is, one of the most important organs that gets neglected is the kidney. And if you are in your 40s, but you already have a glomerular filtration rate at 80% of what would be predicted, you have to fast forward a little bit and say, well, what's that going to look like when you're 80? The net implication to me has been a much greater focus on blood pressure, even sort of stage one, so slightly elevated blood pressure that I think many physicians until recently probably just weren't thinking of as a significant enough problem. But once you do start looking at that microalbumin and that cystatin C, as a non-nephrologist, we get a little bit of a window of insight into your world. And there are a lot of people walking around. I mean, a staggering amount of people walking around who on the surface, just based on their creatinine, look pretty normal. But a slightly deeper look says, no, actually, they're not normal. They are, they are compromised. And it won't be clinically relevant for 30 or 40 years, but that's going to be relevant. The thing is that there are no symptoms. So I, I see people all the time with diseases like IgA nephritis, which is the most common sort of primary kidney disease in the world. And they will not know it and they will have lost sort of like 95% of their kidney function by the time I see them just because they never knew they had a problem because they never checked it. It's very silent in that way. You just don't know you have a problem unless you start looking for these things. And that's why it's important to sort of keep an eye on the urine. And it's so easy too, right? It's, it's non-invasive. Anybody can do 